Uh, before we kind of start, you can see I'm already a little lower on my energy. Um, you are all hopefully aware of what's going on in Western North Carolina right now. I'm a North Carolina native. I have friends there. I have gotten communication, so they're okay. But, you know, that's still something that's going on. And, you know, I sent that message. So, you know, problem set three, you've got until Friday. If you need more time, email me, you know. That's, I know that you got stuff that might be uh, a little bit more, sorry, a little bit more uh, important going on. So just kind of take care of that. Um, however, I do want to kind of say, you know, this is where we can take a lot of what we're doing and really just take that energy and that mo hopefully it motivates you. Um, you know, I don't like using this as a learning moment, but, you know, what we learned in class, even though it's, you know, what I called traditional AI, what it, I said that was, uh, you know, it's not the big fancy neural networks and chat GPTs, you know, that stuff is still being used out there in the world. Like, you know, you can see this, I, I just, you know, as we were, as I was watching all this stuff unfold this weekend, you know, Hey, they're simulated annealing, problem set three. What you're doing right now, that can be used in disaster relief. When roads go down, you know, uh, the big thing is, like, we have areas that need support. We have distribution centers. Rather than it being person and fruit or whatever, I, you know, I, I gave y'all, you know, that same stuff is still being used to this day, especially if you think, you know, we got 25 counties right now that are essentially just under emergency watch or, you know, whatever, you know, right? So that's 25. That's already a big number in the factorial, and that's just counties. That's not talking about roads uh, and those distribution centers. So, you know, this is why we, we do these things. It's not just so we can learn math or, you know, what we're going to talk about today in logic. It's that our big thing is, like, where can we find real-world situations to really apply these things? And so, you know, this is stuff that we are starting to look at, and this is an important area of research. Maybe, you know, those of you thinking about game design, well, I really do strongly believe simulations are going to be a big thing because it's expensive to go do, the, you know, that intelligence stuff out there in the real world. It takes money to build it. Throw up Unity, you know, turn on the gravity, you know, physics engines. We're going to start seeing these things come into play, and even as we start getting into, you know, this is a little bit past what we're doing, but you can see, you know, we're still looking at this from an adversarial search and rescue, you know. Your agent's job is, oh, I want to be the one to do the rescuing. Well, now it's competing against another agent also wanting to do it. And why do we do that? Well, think about it from that sense of we're just trying to improve our actual agent. So there's a lot of work in specifically this idea of disaster, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Disaster recovery um, that we are still doing in kind of our world too. I know um, Dr. Rudra Duda uh, here, he's much more in the network side, but specifically I do remember I spoke to him when I first toured this campus, and he was looking at it as when cell towers go down, how, how do we use what we have, like Bluetooth signals, all that white space. I mean, it's, you know, there's Wi-Fi going on right now. How do we do network recovery when the main lines are down? So, uh, Sorry, again, took a little too much of that, uh, but, uh, you know, hopefully you kind of, if you have family friends, you know, do try and reach out, check in with them. If not, please recognize that you got colleagues and, you know, classmates that may be dealing with some stuff in the background. So just kind of give them a little bit of time to kind of come together. So, good, yeah. Okay, all right, good, good. Now, if you give me half a second, I got to collect myself because, as you can see, you know, I got to do this for the next 70 minutes. Come on, put on it, put on it. 
All righty, ladies and gentlemen. So now we are in the second section. So you, you had your midterm. We're getting that graded up. Again, give us a little time. We're still working on that. However, what I want to kind of present to you is this idea that where we were just, you know, again, I just talked about this idea of simulated annealing, and that still serious. Right? I'm putting on a character right now. But there are limitations to what the traditional search style AI can do. And one of those big things that we, you've seen, right? This is now as you've kind of played around with LLMs or ChatGPTs, you've prompted them occasionally. They're okay, they give you the answers, but then sometimes it's, uh, you know, not. And oftentimes it's because of this thing right here, this idea of logic and building agents that are capable of kind of taking in context, making assessments, drawing conclusions, rather than trying to just find a configuration or a pathway. Also think about it in that sense of like, hey, maybe I want to be able to, what's the word I'm looking for? Again, draw a conclusion, deduce some knowledge based on what we're doing. So a little bit of this, again, it, it is going back to our formalities of things, but you know, again, how I'll kind of present this is, Use this time in this class to kind of just help clear your mind of any worries that you got going on uh, of, you know, family, friends. Use this as just like, hey, I'm going to come in here and just like cloud everything else out. And I can focus on just like, let's how, let me learn this stuff. So with that in mind, you know, again, as we're looking at this stuff, um, we have this idea of informal language. What I'm doing right now is informal language. There's no rhyme or reason to it. There's no structure to it. Honestly, you know, if you were to try and build captcha, uh, captions off of my text, right, when's the per when do I have a period, right? You've seen how I talk, right? It's a mile a minute sometimes. So that's where we get a little bit of a difference. And this is, where, this is what you see in programming, right? We call... Java, we call Python, we call our programming languages something known as a formal language. And it breaks down into a number of different steps, but from that logic perspective, right, we still need this context of what is syntax. We need now what are the rules, what's the semantics of our system, you know, again, what, what are we allowed to do? And then what we have at the end is this idea of a proof system or a knowledge base, right? How can I now check that, that, that expression that I built, right? If I build that, you know, whatever expression using my syntax, my, my semantics to make it a, a valid uh, expression, how can I then go about creating new expressions or evaluations from that? And so kind of where we're looking at this is when we think about it first, when we think logic, right? A little bit of this, maybe refreshers from your discrete math kind of perspective. But the idea is, again, we have this concept of syntax. And when we're dealing with things at just the base level of logic, right? Now we're not looking at it so much from a value perspective, but rather this idea that something can either be true or false. And again, as we start to kind of peel back that idea of logic, that's where we start to get into the where, hey, you know, I need a way to store those trues and those falses. And that's where the variable comes into play. Now, I just kind of built uh, three of them up, but you know, hey, I have a variable and it has some kind of representation. It has a purpose behind it, right? This idea that, oh, position uh, four, three is dirty. Okay, that could be a fact, if we will. It could be a true statement. Or we can have false statements, right? Uh, the summation of 5 and 7 is 10. Not 10. It's not 10, right? It's a, it, it's a completely different... Uh, uh, it's still a sentence. It's still... Uh, I can't use it. It's still correctly built from a logic perspective, right? It is stating a fact. The problem is it's a false fact. Uh, 411 is in EV2, true statement. Uh, P or Q, okay, P or R, sorry, right? 
either one of those. It, that is still, you know, in our case, it's, I'm calling it nonsensical, but it's this idea of like, you know, it's still an expression that can be evaluated, right? That had a value, P has a value, R has a value. There's some operator that we use to do an evaluation between these two expressions to generate some new you know, value. And so again, like I, I was saying, a little bit of this is that refresher from your discrete math class, right? Because you did a lot of logic in that class, right? You wish you, you didn't, you know, it's terrible. I got bad news for you. We're still doing logic. We got, oh, there's so, section two is only logic. So, so the entire idea is, yes, we do need to remember, again, our, our little bits, right? The concept of the negation or the ands and ors. But very specifically, the one that's going to be very important to us is the implication, right? Because you know, when you learned this, it was a very simple, simple structure. If, then, something. If P, then Q. And that's, oh, that's, you know, if statements in a nutshell. But that's also rules and structures that we can build and make logical statements from. We will have to deal with the if and only ifs as well, but that's mostly uh, because we don't really have, if you think about trying to translate this into something from code, remember the end game of a lot of our approaches is, can I build this? Can I model this, right? Well, I don't have a, you know, they haven't built a language where I can, I can just like have that, right? Show me your, your, your Java syntax for, you know, two, de you know, two carats and like an equal sign. It's not going to do anything, right? My point being is, so we still have to kind of build them out. That way we can break them down. Uh, so here's where I got more bad news for you. You know those symbols. You love those symbols. You're going to need to remember these symbols. I know. From discrete math, guess what? I expect you to know them. <laughs> No, so I will say uh, when it comes to like the midterm, you know, midterm two, this will be given to you. So you're welcome, right? Uh, I'm, I'm generous there. But uh, why we need to know them is because we're going to be doing a lot of translation of logic into something, you know, cleaner, right? I don't have symbols for that. So I need to be able to translate it into a single implication. Well, I still don't really have, I know, you know, single implication ifs, but, right, you know, where we're going, I, that's still too complex. And so that's where I'm going to need to take that implication and translate it into that or clause, uh, that disjunction, if you will. And again, as we kind of build these things out, you know, one of the things that you can look at is this idea of the truth table. I'll put it this way, right? Again, think about this, what I'm, I'm trying to describe to you, you know, because you, know, you all know Java. At least I hope you know Java. I've seen some of your, yeah, <laughs> my point being, right, you know how to implement true false values, Boolean, right? And so, the way to think about it is, well, I already said that, you know, from our perspective in the logic world, what we're able to do is say, hey, you know, that P just represents a statement, you know, tile here, here is dirty, right? I set whether or not that was a true statement or not. I could say it was true. I could say it was false. Doesn't matter. But that's where, well, if I have a bunch of these, if I start listing out, you know, five or six or seven different variables you know, for statements, well, I can start to represent them. I can build out my truth table, if you will, and this will give me all the possible, you know, evaluations, right? If I did, you know, have a P and a Q value, right, just arbitrarily without uh, uh, giving them any other, um, what's the word, any other relation, right, then I could start to expand on that and say, hey, oh, you know, when... When I say I would look for not P's, right, those are true. When I try and do P's and Q's, 
And right, you know, one of them, when I do P's or Q's, one of them's false, right? I can build this idea of starting to map out all my different relations, if you will. So we do have a little bit of terminology that we got to go through, right? You will need to know them, but, it, you know, again, it's in that sense of just like, because so many of our kind of definitions or rules rely on kind of being familiar with something being valid. Now, here's where I can give you a little, you know, a little bit. Never ask a professor, especially a logic professor, never ask a logic professor if something you're doing is valid. Don't ever. Why? Why? Because I've dealt with it. Why? Because I asked a logic professor if a, an approach I was doing in homework was valid. Ah. Oh. And they were like, no. And still give me points. What? Why? The reason why is because, in, you know, the, the instructor told me why afterwards. It's because specifically, right, when we look at the term valid from a logic perspective, every iteration of that perspective must be true. That means, right, if I have a p value, I have this variable, I have a, a Boolean p, any interpretation of it, you know, again, as I'm building my implications of those giant structures that you had to do in discrete math, right, uh, those giant expressions, every single one of them must evaluate to true. And that is why, you know, suddenly my logic professor is like, oh, I can't quite say yes to a, a, your statement because you're asking about validity and they take it in the logic, you know, definition, which means every, you know, I, my approach is true for all iterations of this problem ever in the universe. I just needed to know if I was right, right? I get it, I get it. You're going to find those logic professors who are pedantic. I'm not, but I am at least cynic, uh, uh, cynical enough to you know, go on a rant about them. Uh, but what you're really looking for when you ask that same kind of question is, is it satisfiable? Only one iteration needs to be true now. Only one of my possible configurations. If I can find that. Uh, hold on. You're, you're the, the generation that no longer cares about Marvel, right? You all saw Endgame, right? No. no. <laughs> Someone got very different. <laughs> Doctor Strange. He does that thing, and it's like, I've scanned all the possible uh, uh, probabilities. Only one worked. That's satisfiable. You know, there was one satisfiable way. It wasn't a valid, you know, approach because, you know, uh, then you got Dormammu going on there. But satisfiable, right? Only one of those situations were able to get us to win the end game. Uh, but, right, that's, that's where we kind of go. We do have the inverse of those as well, though. And this is, again, mostly from a definitional standpoint of invalid or unsatisfiable. Two separate words, by the way. Uh, a falsifiable, that's the word I was looking for. Unsatisfiable, always false. Falsifiable, I know I don't have it up here, um, but falsifiable, at least one false. Right? That, that's what those are kind of getting at. And it's mostly about what well, we need to kind of find and remember that those terms exist in our space. Why is because where we're going with this is this concept of knowledge representation. Now, we're going to come back to this. This is why we're spending so much time in logic is like, well, how do we translate Booleans into logic, right? And that is a hard problem that, yeah, but the end game for us is that we can take that knowledge, take our kind of information or facts about the world, and then produce some computer trackable form, some way that the computer is able to monitor, check, and now do evaluations off of that. Uh, so again, this is where, you know, treat yourself like you're an agent for a second. I have a list of facts. 
three facts, in, in, you know. If the bear is hungry, which we will represent with an H, it will forage, which we will represent with F, right? These are just Boolean values, Boolean H, Boolean F. If the bear is foraging, again, that's the F, it will go to the stream, represented as an S. And so that last little fact is bear's hungry. H is true. So now we ask a very simple question, right? Where's the bear? Say it loud, say it proud. The stream, it's at the stream, right? You, know, you follow the rules. If the bear's hungry, well, the bear is hungry, it's foraging. If it's going to forage, it goes to the stream. Like, it's a nice logical chain of events. Where we kind of present this now is like, well, how do I get that to be computer? Or, you know, uh, how do I start to evaluate that? Here's your first approach. It's going to be the worst approach, but it's the approach that you can do. Build out that truth table. Take every single one of your variables and map them to true and false, right? And then what we can do is we can do a process of elimination on where these, these configurations are not true to our what we call knowledge base. So again, we can start to map this out, right? I have all the possible configurations of my true-false values. Now... What are the rules of my world, right? I, I gave you three rules. The first two were kind of real rules, right? Oh, uh, H would imply F, F would imply S, right? Those are built out. Now, all I care about is now just mapping out, well, given if these were the two configurations, H uh, you know, is true, but F is tr and F is true, what would I see? I'd see trues, right? If However, uh, H is not uh, true. This is, oh, that's a bad one. Um, yeah, here we are. Uh, H is true, so the bear is hungry, but they didn't forage, right? Oh, well, you know, I mapped out that that's wrong. Why? Because then, the, you know, the rules aren't following what, or sorry, the, the values that I have are not following the rules that my world has kind of constructed, why I present that is this is where it's a divide and conquer. I start to look at my rules to see where they are holding, essentially, where they are doing exactly what they should be doing. So, again, I know that the bear is hungry, right? H is true. So I can get rid of all of my, my H is falses because those are just wrong. Those are not what are reflected in my, my, my kind of known information, Okay, well, again, if we're looking at that, then I can drop when foraging was false because, again, that's, we're not, this is not evaluate the, the answers. It is where are they following the rules? Where are they actually kind of working, right? So H, you know, hey, if uh, H is true, then F, by logic, you know, by the implication rule, should also be true, then we keep going, right? Then we get that last one where it's like, oh, okay, well, if H is true, that would imply F is true. Well, if F is true, that would imply S is true, right? So as a consequence, you can see, this is how we figure out that question. When you were making the deduction in your own brain of where is the bear given the rules, right? This is what was going on. Because right? if I didn't include that stuff, you just start throwing out guesses. So, you know, we've we've made the deduction. Congratulations! Why am I spending like multiple day, you know lectures on on logic if it's just truth tables? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so why we do this is again we're we're starting to kind of build that construction. I gave you a super simple one to start because, yes, right, I wanted to remind you what discrete math looked like. Uh, but specifically, it was to also introduce what we call the KB, the knowledge base. This is all of the information that the agent believes to be true about its world. 
again, when we think about it, it's just, it's facts, right? We have a very similar thing. You stop at red. Hopefully, I've seen some of y'all driving, right? Stop at red. If the light's out, just, you know, to go and do our, our, right? If all the power's out, it becomes a four-way stop, right? These are rules that we ingrained into our brains, and now we follow, right? We try to maintain those rules. The same kind of concept's going on with agents, logic agents specifically. They have a knowledge base about what the world is like, right? Uh, and why that kind of matters is specifically because we start looking at specific types of questions or, you know, what we call sentences. And what we're looking for is something called entailment. Given my knowledge base, given what I do know about the world, can I answer this sentence? Can I answer this question? Can I evaluate it to be to determine its true or falseness, right? And that's where we get into this idea of the interpretations, right? I can now take what I do know about the world, which may just be rules, and what if I make some assumptions? If I can make some assumptions, maybe that turns into an interpretation. And if I can make some assumptions about my knowledge base, I may be able to make some assumptions about answering that question. And that's where we get, start to get into really interesting things. So again, like I said, one approach, you enumerate. You, you build this giant you know, truth table. What's the problem with that? Why is it slow? Huh? It's exponential. Every single time I make, again, I got two here. Well, that means I got to map out both of them true. One of them false, the other one false, both of them false. I come in and I add in a third variable. Welcome to the binary system, right? Because all of this just became, I got to double. Every time I add in a variable, I'm having to double every possible configuration. And that becomes a major issue, right? Just think about that. Three. That's not a big number. 32 bits. That's 4 billion, right? That's 4 billion possible rows in your truth table. And just that's off of 32 variables, right? That's a small number of variables. This is where we start to get into some of that interesting kind of, again, we're hitting, I don't know. We start bumping into terms and things that you've seen in our space as well. Because again, what we're trying to do is use computer programming to answer questions and to make intelligent decisions, right? If we, you know, we got to remember, we're trying to look, hey, is there ever a possible configuration of all my variables that could in fact answer this sentence? Not satisfiable. Remember, sat not satisfiable means at least one true. Well, that, again, this is Dr. Strange doing the head thing. I got to look through every single one of them. That's where you got to have the fight. And then Spidey's got to do not feel so good, right? I saw it too, right? Then what's happening is, well, if I have to do that entire configuration, just to see if it's satisfiable or not satisfiable, two to the power of n, the number of variables, right? And specifically, just like you were saying, that makes it exponential. And so this is where we open the question, right? This is a question you got, you got introduced to in 316 land, right? Is there an algorithm that could improve it? Is there a better algorithm than the brute force of checking all possible configurations? Because all possible configurations is exponential, right? Is there one that can do it in polynomial time? That's the P versus NP problem. So again, where we're looking at this is as I add variables to my deduction, right? If I have to brute force all of them, it takes forever. Wouldn't it be great if there was a way 
that I could not. I'm not going to give you an answer to that because it's the, <laughs> if I ever figure that one out, I'm peacing out because I think like some people are giving me millions of dollars, right? Or something like that. Uh, yeah, you know, I wish, but yeah, that's what that problem is. But that leads us into kind of a, a, a limitation of this space, right? This is why we're kind of, what I, I showed you and what we've talked about, it's a little too weak. It's a little, the problem with it becomes, again, I have to add variables to everything. Well, what if I wanted to, you know, we're still grading out your midterms, right? You're all very, you're, you're anxiously awaiting your midterms. You know, I have a standing rule. I never really say it until this lecture, but uh, if everyone in the class makes an A on the midterms, I'll shave my head. Done it before, not for y'all, but I've done it plenty of times. It's fun, uh, right? It's right at the winter time too, so, uh, you know. But what, how would I represent that? Again, how would I build out to, you know, actually check on that if I was a logical agent to see if, I needed to, right? Well, one way is for me to brute force all my possible students, right? If Tiffany makes an A, then Adam will shave his head. And if Ethan makes an A, Adam will shave his head. And if Nitty makes an A, I'll shave my head, right? I have to go through every single one of those, which means I got to build a variable for every single one of you. I got 130 of you across two sections, right? Two to the power of 130. That's like at least a thousand, right? I don't want to do all those checks. My point being is that's where we introduced first order logic. First order logic still in discrete math, like stuff you learned in discrete math. Okay, see, you know, right. That's why we introduced it is, that, hey, I don't want to have to brute force, or not brute force, I don't want to have to build out all of my possible, you know, bullions because then I have to brute force them through that. So suddenly it became this idea of let me add some relationships to those variables, right? Let me add a, something known as a quantifier to those variables. And so I can now represent more complex sentences. It's no longer Adam has a beard that turns into a true false value. It's now a relation. There exists some thing in space right? Something in the universe I'm choosing to represent as Adam. And Adam has a relationship beard. We're interpreting that to be a has a relationship, but that's all that is. If everyone makes an A, Adam will shave his head, right? Well, this is the quantifier suddenly because I said everyone well, I have a variable. I have a variable I'm going to call X. And I do this upside down A, this little weird thing, but this is what we call the universal quantifier for all X, such that if X is a student and X has a grade of A, that would imply Adam is now bald, right? It should be shave, but whatever, you know, work with me. Either way, then we've got, okay, well, you know, harsh reality comes back to uh, hit us in the face sometimes. It's been really hard to get all of y'all an A. I don't know why. I don't know why. Checking the camera for the people who are watching at home. Are you actually watching or are you also watching, like, YouTube, right? Or Twitch or whatever you watch. My point being... Right? Some students will make the A. I have another quantifier. Instead of all for all X's, now I have that same variable. Again, I'm still working off of, like, hey, I have an X. Some of my instances, there are going to be some cases where X is a student and X has a grade of A. Right? That, I can represent these things uh, both kind of structures. So this is me just kind of noting that um, of like terms. I will say do not, I, yes, I put capital there. Don't set that in stone, especially when we have to do this in code. Everything flips and you're going to be like, why? 
Anyways, again, we can see we got the variables, we've got the quantifiers, uh, the functions, there's the quantifiers for explicitly kind of establishing them, right? So why is, it, here's a great way of you to read it. Again, that idea of if for all versions of x, for all possible values of whatever x would be, right? And x in this case is referencing any what we call term, right? Anything of, you know, in that atom sense, such that if that x was a student and that's a true value and that x has the true value, uh, x has a grade of A and that's also a true value, then it would imply Adam will be bald. So this is where now, okay, I gave you a little bit, but I, I've been talking. Time for a little group activity. I have a few little sentences. Again, you've done discrete math. You've done first order logic. Please convert. Tweety has feathers. All birds have feathers and can fly. Camilla is a chicken, and all chickens are birds into first order logic. And I'll give you 10 minutes. We'll come back at uh, 345, 345, so nine minutes. And we are back. Let me see how you did. Da, 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 da. I'm going to close out of that. So I don't have to. All righty. All right. Oh, look at that. Nice responses. Okay. Uh, so Tweety has bird, uh, feathers. Uh, I asked for first order logic, didn't I? I said first order logic. So these, you know, I get what you're going with. But remember, I was asking for, you know, this relation. It's not that I'm, I'm giving you uh, like a... a, a Again, these mostly catching these things, uh, you know, as I see them. So again, when we're looking at Tweety implies feathers, that's that's much more of a propositional logic perspective, not first order logic. Remember, we want to have that relationship this time. Uh, so we're looking at these. Hey, you know, there exists some uh, uh, thing in our universe such that that thing is going to be referred to Tweety. I know that that's like su super like hand wavy way of saying that, but like, remember, we're just kind of, uh, you know, there exists something in our world referred to as Tweety, right? And it holds a relationship that it has feathers, right? Then we get into, okay, all birds have feathers. Uh, and what was the rest of that? All, fe all birds have feathers and can fly. So, we got some that are just like for all A, such that A uh, and feathers and fly would be true. You know, uh, I was kind of looking for more of that uh, implication kind of approach that, you know, now kind of establishing rules. Again, this is, you know, I'm not going to fight you on these things, right? Uh, but I'm looking at it from that perspective of much more of a rule-based system, right? It's not just oh, something has to be a bird and feathers and be able to fly. Right now we're saying, oh, you know, if for all X's that I have that are birds, that would imply that X also has feathers and X can fly. So that's kind of where we're looking at, it. So you know, trying to have some of these rules uh, built out. And then we got uh, Camilla is a chicken. Uh, looks like everyone got Camilla is a chicken again, you know. Um, and then that same kind of concept of, well, hey, we're trying to make sure that we're looking at it from that rule kind of base. That would imply that for all X is such that if X is a chicken, that would imply that X is also a bird, right? Again, you know, it's, it's mostly because we're trying to build out rules you, you, you'll hear me say this a lot, but like this idea of the knowledge base, right? We're trying to build out rules for the universe, right? That's, that's because we're trying to represent things and be able to draw conclusions from that knowledge base. So we're trying to look for rules for it. Why I say that is, what's wrong with my knowledge base? The 
only things that apply in you know, for like vanilla is a chain and all trees are birds. Like there's nothing relating to this specific. Oh, that's fine. You know, knowledge base. Chickens can't fly. <laughs> well, they can. Uh, I normally kind of pull out. Well, penguins. Even though I'm not referencing a penguin anyway, penguins can definitely cannot fly. Chickens. I don't know what they can. I mean, they can hover, right? Yeah, they glide. They glide, right? They can. They can leap softly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, they can't fly, right? Technically, what is flying? Well, it's falling with style. That's a reference my generation, uh, right? But the idea is, right, my rules, and this is kind of something that you have to deal with, like you may build the wrong set of rules, and that's, that sucks, right? That's where it's like, oh, we got to make sure that we do things right. Not every bird has feathers. Uh, does every bird have feathers? Now I'm, trying to, now I'm looking at penguins again. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, I know it's one, ah, whatever. I'm not a biologist, math people. My point being, right, I do know that not every penguin can, or not all penguins can't fly, except for the ones in MOOC. Anyways, my point being is now we got to introduce, hey, you know, why we, we did this is, remember, we, what we have is this idea of variables, and we're trying to ask and answer questions, or our agent is trying to answer or ask them. So that's where essentially what we start looking at is, well, hey, now that I know rules of like, oh, a chicken would imply it can, ha uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a bird, right? And birds have feathers and can fly, at least in our tiny little universe, right? Are there ways, or are there terms that I have in my world that I could substitute out my variables for? Could I, hey, for all, you know, some variable in some sentence A, could I substitute those variables for some actual term? Some, you know, you see it's called G and I'm, I'm saying ground term, but some actual term, right? And we'll see an example in a second. Well, there we go, right? For all x, y, such that if x holds a relationship of student to y, well, that would imply x is a person and y is a student. Okay? Right? It's just a rule I threw out there. Now, could I substitute that with some terms if I have some terms available to me? For example, could I substitute x with a term named Andrew? And could I substitute Y with a term in CSU? Oh, well, what gets produced as a result? What ha changes in my sentence? Well, my sentence becomes that Andrew is a student, or, you know, for student Andrew in CSU, that would imply Andrew is a person and in CSU is a school, right? I'm adding context to kind of these statements, right? Oh, you know, uh, the relationship of Andrew to uh, NCSU. Again, that's what that G term is uh, meant to do is it's like, hey, you know, I can swap out that X, that amorphous X that you have in your rules with a, a grounded term, something that does exist that is tangible in your world. And if this statement still holds true, right? Is there a student named Andrew at NCSU? You don't want to just like, probably, satisfiable? It's a satisfiable, right? That same kind of concept could go on, right? Now, you know, here's another example. Uh, could I substitute X for Colby? And could I substitute Y for hard knocks? That would mean yeah, the relationship of student Colby Hard knocks would imply that Colby is a person and hard knocks is a school. All right? Okay, good. Well, again, that same kind of concept. Does it exist? What does it mean? That's a different thing, right? But we also have the existential, right? I said there was a for all and then there was a sum, right? For our sake, it will look the same, right? hey, right, we're getting away from theory, turning it into application a little bit. When I'm dealing with some variable, not every variable, some variable in my sentence, 
Can I swap that for some constant? Can I get rid of that ambiguity of there being like some, in this case, tiles that are dirty, right? Can I get rid of that and translate that into some more constant term? In this case, I'm just calling it, hey, like tile 11 or, you know, 1, 1, depending on how you want to look at it. That same concept can go on. It, this is where it will look the same when we start to put this into application, right? That, that part is good. That's what we want. Um, but from a logic standpoint, they do have slight variations. This is more just like kind of rules of the road. So, ooh, excuse me, right? As we kind of get into it, when we start to bring up those quantifiers, right, for alls, I don't need to put, I, you know, order doesn't matter when I put them together, right? For all X, for all Y, swapping them does not change the definition. Like if you were to read these statements out uh, of X is a parent of Y would imply Y is a child of X, right? If I flip those, like I flip the for alls, that didn't change the definition, at all, right? It's still, if X is the parent of Y, that would imply Y is the child of X. I still, you know, the ordering in this case didn't matter. We can shorthand that. That's just mostly for our sake of like writing. However, that was when we were using only universal quantifiers. What happens when I start mixing them? Because I have more complicated rules. Complicated, right? Now, Let's look at, oh, there exists some X for all Y, such that X loves Y. What does that translate into English? Oh, well, there exists some person who loves all Y, everyone, everything, right? I flip those rules. I flip the, the for all and the sum that's it. Like, the variables are staying the same. It's just I flip the order of them for all of Y. There exists some X such that X loves Y. So for everyone, right, for everyone, there's someone who loves you. Oh, right? Good feel good piece. So again, you know, other little parts of this that we can go into. If I can have the universal quantifier, I am able to invert that and produce a existential version of that quantifier through negation. So again, if we think about what for all and some are trying to represent, for all, everyone, some, not everyone, right? That. That is what we're essentially getting at. Everyone likes vacation, right? Not like vacations. You got a, a fall one coming up soon, right? I know, right? You're loving that. There is no one who does not like vacation, right? That is that same sentence, but reworded logically, right? Now, that for all X is now there does not exist some X, right? Negations, not exist some X that does not like vacation. Someone likes homework. Who likes homework? Thank you, thank you. I only need one. I only need one, right? Well, I can reverse that. I can say the exact same thing, but reworded they're, you know, uh, f not for all of X, right? Not for all of X, someone, some X does not like homework. Not everybody does not like homework, right? The same thing. This is now like we're mincing English and you, you start realizing that English sucks a little bit. Yes, right? That's why we have math to represent our sentences, uh, but more to my point of why we kind of present this is this idea that, hey, you know, I can start to make conjunctions with these statements. I can start to make connections. When I say something is a universal uh, for all X 
such that X is a cat would imply that X is also a mammal. That means any substitution I do with X like holds that statement still, right? You know, Max is a cat, me is a cat, Sylvester is a cat. When we look at sum, that becomes a disjunction, right? That's an or clause going on there. Versus for all conjunction, two separate things. Slightly different, but the same at the same time. But why this matters, like why we keep seeing this, and again, we'll come back to this. We're not done with logic is because we get all your favorite discrete math words. De Morgan's comes back. Oh, look at your De Morgan's. Well, look at what you got to do. You've done this. You've done this since math class, right? Pushing the negative in on a multiplication or on a plus, right? What do you do when you push a ne negative into parentheses that had a plus sign inside it? You flipped it. You changed it from a plus to a minus. You were doing De Morgan's, right? And you flip, you change. So you've, you know, you've seen these things, but we have to, again, do this because uh, oftentimes what we're trying to you know, get to, again, how do I describe it? This is something that is both slightly implemented in AI and also still not there is what, how I kind of want to present this. Like what I'm presenting is why we focus on these things. We can't do this quite yet. But if we can push things down into this space, I do have things that I can represent that way, right? That's where we start to kind of look at these things. Um, so this is just me kind of throwing out that generalized here are all the rules um, kind of thing. Learn them. This is one of those like make a little note on what slide to just remember for your note sheet for midterm two kind of things, right? Yeah. So why we present this is this idea now of unification, right? I've presented you all these different words. I reminded you what discrete math was all about. You're regretting discrete math again for some odd reason. Uh, but hopefully I win you over. If not, you know, at least I was satisfiable in my approach, right? No, the entire idea is, hey, I have two sentences. I have some P and some Q. Okay, well, what I can do with this is go, hey, is there some substitution that I could make? Are there some assumptions that I could make that would make these two sentences equal each other? And why I present that is typically what that turns into is one of them has variables, and we're trying to ask, hey, could I swap those variables out for something to make it equal the same thing, right? To make a uh, 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 theta in this case, or make a theta. Can I produce some theta of substitutions that I can use to make these two things equal each other? So we can start to look at this, right? Again, we're thinking about it from a, a rule-based, knowledge base approach. This idea that it's not just one sentence floating out in space, but it's a relationship between other rules and other facts that I happen to know in my knowledge base, right? Maybe I know that uh, Wally -E is a robot. Maybe I also know that T24 is a tile. And maybe I know that Wally -E is located at T24. Those are all just facts, right? They're just facts floating out in space. And so now I can say, well, hey, you know, for A to clean, a thing, that would imply, or a B, right? For A to clean a B, that would imply that A needs to be a robot and B needs to be a tile and A needs to physically be located at that B tile, right? Well, are there substitutions that I can make? Sure, and we'll see, you know, I, I already show you the theta going on here, right? Well, I can swap out like A for Wally, and I can swap out B for T24. And then specifically, if I make those substitutions, what can I imply? I can imply that Wally cleans T24. 
Ooh, so I can, I can make rules, right? I didn't know that, or sorry, I can make interpretations. I don't have in my knowledge base, you know, one through four, anything talking about Wally cleaning, right? I have where Wally is, I have what Wally is, but I don't have what Wally does. I have the rules assigned for when you do a thing. Well, if I can swap my term, my variables for my terms, that means I can now take that rule, that amorph that ambiguous rule, and quantify it. Oh, hey, I can make this sentence, right? I can say Wally cleans tile 24, and it resolves to a true statement. Why? Because I have rules that are valid. Now we're starting to get into the validity term, right? Now every interpretation of this is going to be correct. So again, what we're looking at is this idea of those substitutions off of some assumption. Uh, and why we present that is, again, we're trying to figure this part out. We're going to keep coming back to I'm not sending you right away, right? Uh, but like, we're going to keep coming back to this idea of like, how do I get those substitutions? Because, yes, that's the hard part. Building out the knowledge base, again, it's, it's its own hard part, but also at the same point, like, right, some of those rules are set in stone. Um, so given these rules and making these substitutions, I can make inferences. OK, all right. But what if I don't have the substitutions? That's what I'm talking about, right? Can I ask questions now? Now I don't have those substitutions, right? There's no theta. But now, notice it's not me trying to infer new rules. Welcome to asking questions, asking and creating queries. Who here's taken databases? I don't like that you did this. You either did or did not take the, you're, you're currently in it. Okay. That makes me feel better. <laughs> right? You're making queries, right? You're, you're, you're trying to go through the rows of a table to see where it's true, right? I'm making the same question. Hey, you know, can Wally clean T24? I don't know. Okay, fine. You know, that's very similar to what we, we just asked. But what if I start to fuzz this a little bit. Now I don't know all the variables, right? I don't know all the terms in concrete. What if I started wanting to ask other questions? Now it's a matter of like, oh, I go through all my tiles, and I ask, well, hey, what if there's a variable? Like, I don't know this x. I'm trying to find out this x. Who cleans T24? Can you still make that interpretation? Yeah, you can, because you are intelligent, you know, rational agents. How do I get the computer to do that? And again, we'll, we're spending a lot of time on this one, right? Oh, well, I know if I could swap out the X for Wally, that wouldn't be, that gets interpreted to true, right? What substitutions can I make that would make my question a true statement? that same kind of question can come in, right? Well, maybe it's not, hey, you know, uh, um, what's the word? I'm, instead of my, my X, right, maybe I don't know what Wally should be doing, right? I know, you know, hey, he should be cleaning. What should Wally clean? What should Wally clean? Can I make a substitution such that this X gets swapped with something that would still be true in my knowledge base? Right? It's the T24. Or I can go even more ambiguous. I could ask the question of like, hey, you know, just where if I have some X and some Y, could I find some substitution of X and Y that would be true? Who's cleaning what? Right? That's what I'm asking here. Yes, exactly what I say there. Who's cleaning what going on? Um, so now i got to present you nice, you know, we'll get into like actual tackling of this uh, on, on Wednesday, right? But, you know, we can kind of work through this a little bit, 
right? We can, just because even before we try and add, turn this into something we do uh, uh, programmatically, we can learn a little bit about it, right? I have this question, right? We, asked this, we answered this question at the beginning of class, right? Where is the bear? Where is Yogi located? Yogi being a term that is located at some x. Well, can I find a value, a term in my knowledge base that would give me that answer? And so how could I figure this out, right? Again, well, if we're looking at it, to be located for Yogi to be located at some x, that, again, don't think of this as like set in stone answers. This is me working, talking through it more of like, oh, an agent trying to figure these things out. If Yogi is located at X, that would imply that uh, Yogi is foraging and uh, whatever X is, that's a stream. Okay, all right. Well, now I ask two questions. Is Yogi foraging? Well, if we look, all right, we don't have, we still don't have the rule that Yogi's foraging. So what does it mean to forage, right? Whatever this term, right, it's not a term, it's a relation. Well, to for forage implies two things. So for Yogi to forage, that would imply that Yogi is a bear. Is that a true statement? Yeah, because we look in the knowledge base and we see, hey, there's that first fact that we have in the world. There exists some term called yogi that has a relationship bear. Same thing. And hungry yogi. Do I have some term in my database that holds a relationship hungry? Yeah. Yeah. That's number two in my list. Okay, so this is true. This is true. So this is true. And stream needs to be X. Well, again, this is where we have to, again, we'll start to see this on Wednesday, but like, notice, well, that rule's true. That's a floating variable that I haven't figured out a substitution for. So what substitutions, what terms do I happen to have in my world that I could swap X for and get a true statement? Yeah, yeah. I could swap out X. Oh, that's a... I could swap out X for yellow 